Ah, uh, g'day guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Wildcard. Thank you for being the greatest rugby fans in the world and watch my stupid content. I really do appreciate it. You are here today because it is Tuesday and it's time to read some rugby news. Now, uh, so there was no Six Nations last week that had a break and uh, the week after this weekend will be another break. So uh, yeah, the Welsh have decided they want a three week break and uh, there's some talks that the players could potentially go on strike this weekend and skip the England match. Yes, they're going to skip a whole match against England. Uh, and uh, yeah, so there was uh, a lot of, you know, speculations that th th this could actually occur. Warren Gatlin came out and said he's pretty confident that the game will happen despite uh, that he was supposed to announce the team as I'm recording this video, right? The team was supposed to be announced, but it didn't happen because... A player's potential strike. Warren Gatlin, to his credit, still sat at the team announcement and just like talked about uh, not able to announce in the team. But the players are in training, so it is expected to go ahead. It is a bit of a bit of a. There has been like ongoing financial issue in the Welsh rugby union at the moment. It's, we've been reporting this for a few weeks now, but things really starting to boil over. Uh, as the crux of the matter is that the every like six years or so the welsh rugby union will wales rugby union will go into a new agreement with the regions the four uh regions club regions grad dragons cardiff ospreys and scarlets and basically give them like how much basically tell them how much money they're going to be getting and this agreement has not been uh approved and it's basically leaving the clubs unable to offer contracts to a lot of the players. It's estimated like 60 to 100 players at the moment could just be like not have a contract anymore by the end of the year. So yeah, there's a lot of um, ongoing question marks on the players and this could actually be attributing a lot of the poor playing by the Welsh team as well because players are not with their you know financial futures uncertain. Uh, with that being said, there's a lot of pressure from the players to, uh, to, to, yeah, to push ahead and try to get the deal through. Uh, so the current deal is actually coming out, suggesting that they're going to be paying the players 80% of what they used to earn and with a 20% bonus of, for winning. And this, yeah, this has got a lot of players riled up, essentially. They don't think it's fair. Uh, they, they feel like, you know, um, they, yeah, they're just not happy with this because they, they feel like one of the things is that if you don't get selected for the team, then you're going to miss out 20% of your pay, essentially. So it's especially, yeah, so it's, it's not a deal that the players... Uh, really want that that's kind of like boils into this whole potential strike that's coming up uh, against England this weekend so with that being said there's another thing that the players wants to scrap is a 60 cap rule so in Wales at the moment you have to play a minimum of 60 test caps uh, to be able to be, to be eligible for selections if you don't play under one of the four Welsh regions we just talked about so yeah uh, it's pretty dire situations it's kind of like uh, the, the, the this has been dragging on since like end of last year and it's finally kind of boiled over to this tipping point where the players kind of demanding uh, better treatment by Wales uh, Rugby Union. Uh, with that being said, right, with that being said, the the uh, Sir Clive Woodward had a similar issue in 2000 where the English players went on, was talking about going on strike uh, due to a very similar situation as well where a sixty thousand dollar like package that was offered to the players, uh, basically it, 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 on top of the the be, for being selected and being played. Uh, so this bonus was that the players did what didn't wasn't happy with. They just wanted everybody to get the same amount, but then regardless of uh, you know whether they were played or not, whether they were selected for the twenty two test match or not, they just want everybody to get a paid amount. So that was uh, led by the captain at the time against Woodward's wishes. Uh, there were players were going out on strike, but Woodward obviously suffering from dementia. Uh, despite at the time, Woodward came out and basically told the players, "Hey, if you are not going on getting on the training pad at 11 a.m. in the morning, you are not going to be playing this weekend." And uh, and he also called out that to be one of the saddest days in the history of England rugby. He has reflected uh, on 2000 and on the 2000 incident in England, and he said that, "Hey." Looking back at it, I'm pretty proud of the players that handled the situation. Despite he was calling them, uh, calling it the darkest period of, of like the, the, the decision for the players to not play was the darkest thing in England rugby's history. He thought they did the right thing suddenly, right? And he went on to slam Wales 
you know, as is typical fashion about not uh, looking after their players, yada, yada, yada. But yeah, he needs to be checked for dementia, for sure. But like we just talked about, the team announcement has been called off. So Gatlin just sat in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the meeting room and talked about some, any, everything else instead of, yeah, just face the media for like 20 minutes. Uh, England, on the other hand, has been sharpening the tools, getting ready to, to head to Cardiff and uh, collect a free wing. And they have caught in uh, a few big names. So George Ford has returned to the pack for England. Tom Curry and Courtney Laws has returned from injury. Courtney Laws hasn't played since July against Australia. Uh, Tom Curry had a bit of an injury, I think, uh, I think in November test. So his brother has been playing. So Tom Curry has been back as well. So the two, but yeah, I think Courtney Laws would be the biggest addition to the England four pack. Uh, I he's he was the captain for England team in Australia, despite like a heavily run down team in Australia. England still was able to walk out with the uh, series win 2-1 over Australia. So I felt calling loss missing in November test really hurt England as well. Uh, the only player that was going to miss out is Ollie Hassel Collins, who's suffering from a knee injury uh, to the England side. Next up, yeah, so calling loss has come back. Uh, so Kyle Sinclair, on the other hand, has suffered a bit of front and fire during training. Uh, he's been reported suffering from a little bit of a, a, a cut on his, on his nose. Uh, facial injury, so he might not be able to play on the weekend, depends on how that goes. So Marlo Tuilangi, his test rugby uh, return is pretty much this for Six Nations is over. He's, he might be able to make it till, yeah, he got what? He might be able to make it to the task last test. Yeah, basically over for Six Nations uh, as he's been red carded on the week weekend. This was um, a bit of an interesting red card as well. He was getting tackled. And he tried to fend off the other player, and he basically threw an elbow at him uh, whilst carrying the ball. So this is it's very rare for the ball carrier to get a red card. Um, but yeah, he did. He was very reckless. Literally looked like he threw an, an elbow. Or well, he did throw an elbow straight into the, the jaw, almost hit him in the neck uh, on this. Uh, who was this guy? I don't know his name. Uh, but yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, um, it was pretty bad, and he came after the game apologizing but he did get a red card he will be out for us foreseeable time due to suspensions and with that being said the uh england rugby house has also faced their own financial issues in in the club levels so uh, a guy named sir nigel boardman so <laughs> that sounds like the fakest name ever boardman okay he's the board sir boardman will um will be leading to a financial review team, essentially, to, look, to be looking after the Premiership Rugby's um, finances. So two clubs has already gone under as a result of, you know, poor financial foresight. Uh, not oversight, not foresight, oversight by the RFU. So the uh, Wasps, London Wasps and the uh, Worcester Warriors have already gone under. And basically, yeah, they have caught in Sir Boardman to, um, to basically hosting a financial monitoring panel under the RFU to make sure that this doesn't continue. With that being said, uh, red flags are raising for the Leicester Tigers as they are looking to raise $13 million to save the team. Otherwise, they are facing financial ruins as well. So a lot of these English teams have taken up a lot of these kind of like uh, loans during the pandemic to try to like rescue themselves, kind of like keep themselves afloat during the pandemic. And these loans are basically come to collect uh, and, and, have, and they have to basically pay off a, a huge chunk of the, the, basically the loans. So you pay the interest over the years and then at the end, you're going to pay back the principal. So they're all going to pay back. It's basically time for them to pay back the principal now. A lot of these clubs are struggling. So let's the Tigers is the one actually under, under a lot of scrutiny at the moment. Uh, despite, you know, Bothwick was bought out by the RFU. So the, the Leicester Tigers got handed money by the RFU for, you know, giving up their head coach uh, and the assistant coach, uh, uh, Singfield. I think it's Singfield as well. Uh, and basically was given like, what, one million pound windfall, yeah, to buy out their coaches. They were still falling short by 13 million pounds. Yeah, and, uh, and they basically come out and try to blame it on the fact that the uh, the uh, the warriors and the, uh, the the wasp went under and was costing them money because they they had there's two like home games missing so they blame it on the the other two clubs that went under but it, it I mean thirteen million dollars shortfall 
it's not gonna you're not gonna make thirteen million dollars with two home games. Uh, it, it's that's just not that's just not um, that's just not realistic. So it's yeah, it's definitely not that not the, I mean it's definitely gonna hurt you, but it's definitely not the sole issue that that the Tigers are facing. But yeah, despite winning last year as well, the Tigers are uh, having a bit of an issue. Uh, then anyway, let's move on to Australia. So Michael Hooper came out this week. Obviously, he's got mental. He has he had mental health issues. Probably still ongoing mental health issues. Last year, he was withdrawn from the Wallabies uh, during the Rugby Championship, and uh, he's come out this week and you know talked about he's ready to to get himself back in the captaincy to to resume captaincy if he was asked by Eddie Jones. And he's also talked about um, how he's in a better mental shape than he was in last year, so which is really really good. And uh, yeah, uh, I mean. You mean, I mean, sometimes it does, you know, with the change in, you know, coachings, change in, um, like, yeah, the, the coaches do help. I don't know. Maybe he was under pressure by the coaches. But, yeah, maybe Eddie Jones' company has given him more hope. Whatever it is, he's feeling a lot better, which is really, really, really good. Uh, with that being said, Eddie Jones is doing God's work again for Australian rugby. And, obviously, one of the main things that people kind of talk about is that Eddie Jones is trying to create noise for Australian rugby. And just like, seriously, the amount of news every week, there's like, what, four or five articles about Eddie Jones about Australian rugby. And it's not even like, not a single game has been played in Australia. And there's like four articles. I have to trim down the articles for this news report because it's just too many. Too many news article reports about Eddie Jones and what he's doing in just one week, in just one last week. Hang on, there's rain coming into my window. In just last week, right? Just last week, there was a lot of talk about. But yeah, Eddie Jones is just constantly in media trying to, you know, promote Australian rugby. He's out at the trials, uh, in the Super Rugby trials, watching the teams, and really just doing a lot of work, getting some a lot of exposure. And obviously, Eddie Jones is really smart. He knows the audience. He knows where the fan base is at, which is the rugby league fan base. He wants to convert them back into rugby union fans. And one of the things that he went, he, he went and did was talk to a uh, gas. Uh, Gus Gould. So Gus is one of the like uh, NRL pundits. I, I watch his content. I, in fact, I don't watch any rugby league like in terms of the actual game, but I do watch Gus talk about rugby league and he makes it really interesting. Uh, he, he, talk, he gives you a lot of insight about like the rugby league, how the things operate. He has like really strong opinions about the, you know, the, the current like HIA laws how that's ruining the game, how that doesn't really help player safety. He has his own opinions and all that sort of stuff. It's really entertaining to watch. And he's got like a podcast as well that I, I watch. Um, I think it's, it's called like something something with, with Gus. It's like Hard Tackles with Gus or something as a podcast, which I do listen to as well uh, whenever it's on YouTube. And yeah, so, he, uh, so yeah, Eddie Jones, knowing like the reach that this guy's got, speaking to him uh, is just really broadens yeah just really generates a lot of interest for rugby union in the rugby league world right and one of the things that he talked to Gus about was uh he revealed that in 2005 Andrew Jones one of the best rugby league players ever uh was borderline coming to the Wallabies before he was sacked so yeah he basically said that Andrew Jones was sacked and he further on to talk about the kind of players that he wants to bring into rugby at the moment one of the big ones he wants to bring is Cameron Murray uh, to play 12 for the Wallabies. I do think that Samuel Karevi is really good 12, so I don't know if we need another 12, but Eddie Jones really likes to bring rugby league players into Union. Uh, I, here's the thing that I do I, I, I do like is that Eddie Jones is creating a lot of interest here, but I do think that, you know, I, I did have a think about who can actually come over from rugby league to play Union. Obviously, um, we're potentially looking at a fullback, and potentially looking at like a winger, uh, outside of those positions, even a center used to be, you know, ten years ago. It's 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 just like it's pretty much a straight transition for a rugby league player to play center in rugby union. But nowadays, it's just not enough. We saw that with RTS um, as a center. Nowadays, you're expected to to know a lot of the breakdown work. You need to be able to turn over the boss of the breakdown at inside center position. Something that. Um, RTS is really not not able to do. I feel like that's one of the big missing factors for him to starting for the All Blacks. So you can't just bring in another twelve, a rugby league player, and put him to twelve and expect him to to thrive in Union if they don't have extensive experience at the breakdown. Uh, so the other position that the rugby league could potentially import 
is the fullback position. Uh, but fullback position has evolved as well from 10, 15 years ago, where it's no longer just like you get someone like Israel Folau that can catch the ball and then run really fast, and that's all you need. Nowadays, you need to have a good kicking game. So even Israel Folau, um, in the modern, like in, in 2023, his, his kicking game is not quite up to scratch for a fullback. Whilst, yes, he's brilliant at counter-attacking, but his kicking game is just not quite there. So for for rugby league player to if, so if you think about like bring in like Latrell Mitchell or um, uh, James Vesco, they're just not gonna have the kicking game. So the only player I think could potentially play fullback is maybe um, maybe uh, what's his name uh, the Panthers guy. What's his name um, um, Cleary Nathan Cleary because he does have the kicking game that could potentially uh, work in an international test level. I mean for Super Rugby. All these players are great, right? All these rugby league players would dominate Super Rugby, but just the international test match for a Wallaby selection for 15 jersey or the 12 jersey, you need to be more than just being a good ball runner and being, you know. So Nathan Cleary may be good 15, but he's kicking styles more of a 10. So yeah, I wouldn't even put Nathan Cleary at 15 for the kicking duties because his aerial dominance is not quite there. But yeah, it's, it's a difficult situation now. It's not really as easy as it used to be where you can just go, I grab this guy, uh, you know, we'll, we'll just take, you know, with uh, window Sailor and he's going to fit in just fine in the rugby union platform. So the only position still kind of like work is wing. So maybe the only one I think could potentially be a good selection for the, because Wallabies do need another good winger is um, getting potentially the Fox. Uh, what's his name? Um, Josh Adokar, potentially as a winger. But yeah, with 12 and 15, I do think that there's too much technical stuff for someone to just instantly, for a rugby league player to come in and go to the, take it to the rugby world card with just one season. So anyway, I went on a bit of a tangent. Let's move on to the next part. So yeah, he did talk about Cameron Murray, well, wanting him to play 12 for, for the Wallabies. Uh, but anyway, there's too much Eddie Jones stuff already, opportunities for golden players. There are a lot of articles. Let's just not talk about that. Let's go to the next one. Um, so Rhys Hodge has signed a deal with France in Bayonne uh, after the Rugby World Cup. He'll be, leave, he'll be going there for three years. So yeah, good on him. But Rhys Hodge is a great player. Again, Rhys Hodge, if he had been playing for the Reds or playing for the Waratahs or even for the Brumbies, he will be one of the greatest players ever for the world, for, 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 in Australia. But the fact that he plays in, for the Melbourne Rebels, which is an absolute rubbish team, that complete wasting of his talent, um, yeah, really, really sad. But anyway, so yeah, there's a more issue came out of South Africa this week. Again, due to like, I guess, racial issues or like conflicts. Um, diver yeah, anyway, so basically the South African Rugby Union has invited a team from Tel Aviv, which is in Israel. Uh, the Tel Aviv Heat to play in the Mza Mzasi Challenge, which is the first division of the Curry Cup, which is technically the seventh division, second division. So the Curry Cup has a premiership. Pre so, so, the, so basically in South Africa, there is the, uh, no, sorry, the URC at the top. And then you have the Curry Cup at the second tier, which is the premiership league. And then the, the first grade, which is the second tier of Curry Cup, which is called the Mzasi Challenge. That's the second tier, but they call them first tier, right? It's like, you know, you're easier to get laid if you tell people you played for the first grade instead of second grade, even though you are technically in the second grade. But anyway, so the second grade Curry Cup, level two, uh, they've been invited to play in that. And then they they were, uh, they are, they, the, 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 the South African Rugby Union came out and basically re invited them and then it rejected them based after threats from the Palestinian groups for, you know, having um, apartheid-based teams in the competition because obviously the, 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 the Israel has this uh, policy where they're evicting Palestinians from Israel. Uh, anyway, I won't get into the politics. You can look that up yourself. So the Palestinian um, were Palestinians were protesting this, but then this also triggered the South, South African for Israel group, which is the Jewish community, to respond so now there's a big escalation between the jewish community and the palestinians based in south africa of whether or not this team should be um should be should be allowed in the competition 
And uh, yeah, as a result, there is, you know, submission file to World Rugby to look into this. So there's a lot of potential problems coming out for, for South African rugby. So there's a, the, the general belief is that um, most people want the team to play in the tier one, in, in the Carrier Cup, in the, in the tier one, division one of tier, division two of the Carrier Cup, right? But there's a few minority groups threatened and uh, that led to the South Africa Rugby Union to pull them out. But, you know, a lot of these people want that to be reversed. So, big issue came out of South Africa then. Uh, so, anyway, there was a record attendance crowd in the URC on the weekend with um, the Bulls playing against, uh, who was it? Uh, Stormers at home, 41,000. So, yeah, definitely can't get that in Super Rugby. So, really good to see that. The, uh, the South Africans are doing much better in their club rugby as well after leaving Super Rugby. Uh, Rassi Rasmus has obviously talked about the scheduling for the Springboks over the week. I have to include him, okay? He's the highest clickbait of my new segment. So I have to include him. There will probably be a picture of him in the front page so everybody will click on this video, right? But anyway, let's talk about what it's... Well, let's, let's have a look at the schedule for the Springboks. So Springboks obviously have three test matches for the Rugby Championships. Um, it's going to be Australia, in Pretoria, New Zealand, in New Zealand, and Argentina, um, uh, in Arge Argentina at home, and then they will have three uh, warm-up matches before the Rugby World Cup, and one of the warm-up matches will be against Argentina, in Argentina, and Razi Rasmus has come out and basically explained why they decided on that game. Obviously, uh, he talks about this is this is for you know to 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 to. To get the, 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 the team ready for a passionate fan base in South America. But the reality is, everybody knows the reality is that the rugby championship has a TV schedule they need to fulfill. And the fact that it's shortened to three due to the Rugby World Cup, they have to play an extra game to fill up the TV schedule. Same with the, the Blood of the Cup of the Australian side and New Zealand. They have to play an extra game to fill the TV scheduling. But Razi wants to tell you that. It's passionate South African fans, sorry, passionate South American fans that they wanted to get used to to, to play that. But with that being played, then they're going to go to Cardiff to play Wales and go to Twickenham to play the All Blacks to finish off their warm-up before the Rugby World Cup. Uh, so Ireland has also uh, come out with a bit of an injury going into the this, next, uh, this weekend's round three of the Six Nations. So Ty Byrne has been ruled out the, the team due to uh, for 12 weeks due to a uh, ankle injury. Uh, with that being said, the uh, there has been a few returns for the, for the, for the Irish team as well. Uh, the big one is Kieran uh, Treadwell and Joey Carver. So Joey Carver has been added back and he's been out for a while now, in, in uh, even in the club rugby. So he's been added to cover for Johnny Sexton. Uh, and then Joe McCarthy is out with the ankle issue. Uh, the hookers are... Uh, still returning from injuries. So Kian Healy and Dan Sheehan will be returning from hamstring injuries. So yeah, some big, big, big returns for, for Ireland. But uh, we shall see. We shall see. I think they're playing Italy this weekend. So probably Joey Cabri will be starting over um, over um, Sexton. So with that being said, we're almost done. Uh, Super Rugby, obviously there was an, a Zoom call. Obviously there was a tornado in New Zealand. North Ireland uh, was a tornado. Yeah, it was a tornado, I think. And uh, there was a Zoom call to kind of like patch, keep, uh, to keep everyone updated on what's happening in Super Rugby. There were some law changes came out last week. There was some clarification that was issued at this Zoom meeting. But the big one that kind of like came out is that they wanted to shift the way the referee from giving red cards uh, on the spot. They are doing two red cards at the moment. So they have a red card for 20 minute offenses. So like accidental, I guess, hair collusion will be a 20 minute red card. But if it's like a really egregious, like, you know, a player punching out a player, it's still a full game red card ban. So there's two red cards at the moment for Super Rugby. But the emphasis for this Zoom call is that they wanted to move away from giving any red card at all. They wanted to do kind of like the Rugby League uh, system here in Australia where they put players on report, they give out a yellow card, put players on report and let the, um, the, 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 the people deal with it after the game. So they can ban the player after the game, uh, should they, uh, you know, should 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 the the the, the, the incident warrant a, a red card, they just ban them afterwards. They, they they give a yellow card and move on with the game, uh, like the rugby league, the bunker, they put them on report sort of thing. So they wanted to kind of do that for Super Rugby. We shall see how that goes. And obviously they have a 
you know, a clock now, supposedly, for goal kicking and scrummaging. But uh, yeah, that's kind of like pretty aligned with the World Rugby Directive anyway. So finally, Scott Robin, Robinson, uh, Scott Ro Robinson has been offered a job at Fiji to co-take the Fijian Rugby to Rugby World Cup. He has not accepted the, the, the thing. Last week, he came out and basically said that, hey guys, I know who's going to be the All Blacks coach uh, after the Rugby World Cup. <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure who's, who it's going to be. I'm pretty confident where I'm going. And then got a lot of... Um, got a lot of uh, uh, backlash for that because people were like, you're so like disrespecting Foster. And then uh, New Zealand rugby basically came out and like corrected like, hey, no decision has been made. Uh, nothing has been done yet. But he can't like reveal that he was going to be the next coach. But with that being said, he is being offered the position to coach Fiji as the Fijian coach. Uh, Varun Koto has uh, left Fiji. Uh, I think... Yeah, like at the start of this month. And then his assistant coach, Richie Gray, also left um, after, not long after. So now the Fijians have no coach. And uh, yeah, they really need someone good to potentially help um, Australia. Knocking out Wales in the pool stage would be really, really nice. Maybe they can knock out the Wallabies. But um, yeah, it would be good to have Fiji, a strong Fijian team for the Australian pool. Anyway... That is the news. Otherwise, it'd be too easy. You'd be like, we'll win the Rugby World Cup. And then it'd be like, without a challenge, right? I mean, we wanted to have a bit of a challenge. Anyway, uh, with that being said, thanks for watching this video, guys. Like and comment, subscribe. I'll see you guys later this week for uh, for the previews for the Six Nations when Warren Gatlin do announce the Welsh team against England. And uh, we shall see how that goes. Thanks for watching, guys. See you guys later. Cheers.